Welcome to The Founder's Mind. This is your host, Adam Mutchler. On today's episode, I have McKeever Conwell, aka Mac. He's a serial entrepreneur who is currently the portfolio manager at Tedco in Maryland. Mac has built companies from the ground up, sold them, and now he is empowering entrepreneurs to achieve their vision. He is an encyclopedia of startup knowledge grounded in firsthand experience. Mac sheds light on creating connections, sticking out, and doing the things that others won't. Listen closely because Mac drops invaluable knowledge every minute. Mac, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for the invite. I'm a, for those that can't see, because you can't see on a podcast, I'm at Ted Co's headquarters in Maryland. Yes. Um, the offices look really nice. Uh, and we're in a cool conference room up here. And I've got Mac from Ted Co. And we're going to have a conversation. Sounds good. But yeah, it's, I, I'm a little free flow. I've got questions here just to kind of get things started. Um, f- from what I can see on LinkedIn and from, you know, what I follow on Twitter, you, you're up to a lot. And so, <laughs> I, try, I try to get out there. I try to do a lot. So I think a, a, a cool place to start would be, you know, what are you up to right now? Uh, where's your focus and what's got you what's got you moving all right so uh just for all the listeners my name is mckeever conwell i go by mac uh i am i am the person who manages tedco's minority business pre-seed fund it's a brand new fund it's a partnership between us and harbor banks community development corporation where we're 50 50 funding partners to invest in minority-led startups here in the state of maryland so that's my core focus these days. What, guys, I'm always curious sort of how people got into certain positions mm-hmm. or what, what brought you to this role now, okay. because it sounds pretty special. Okay, so I'll give you a quick timeline of... Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm a software engineer by trade. I spent about seven years as a government contractor doing software development for the DLD, um, doing everything from... Hardware simulation, reverse, reverse engineering, to cold fusion, to building apps, to Ruby on Rails, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that was fun. Um, in 2010, me and two of my best friends decided to start a company. It's called Given2. It was a crowdfunding platform for gift giving. Uh, we ran that company for four and a half years. We went through two accelerators, one in Baltimore and one in San Francisco. Um, We ended up selling that technology off to a Fortune 100 company. I then started another company called Redberry, which was an e-commerce platform, a mobile e-commerce platform. I ran that for about a year and a half, went through another accelerator uh, in Philadelphia. Um, That company didn't work out. Um, I ended up getting a job at a a marketing firm here in Baltimore, doing um, leading the, the tech team for all incoming projects. Um, which was soul crushing because I had amassed all these amazing skills and created all these connections and I was working for an organization that wanted me to be a coding monkey. Yeah. And I'm not that anymore. I'm a, I've been a CEO for the last you know few years of my like six, six years of my life at that time. And um, about a year in, I quit the job due to some political differences, um, moral differences. And uh, when I left the job that same week, I saw an opening here at Tedco. So I was like, well, I don't have any financial background. I don't have a business background. I'm actually a college dropout. But what the hell? I'll, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. And I applied. It took four months. And they told me that I didn't get the job they hired me that I applied for. But they had a new position they were creating. And they wanted to know if I wanted to take it. So I jumped at the, I jumped at the opportunity. So that's, that's how I got to Tedco. Nice. What... um. What gets you energized about what you're doing at Tedco? I love startups. It's what I do, it's what I live, it's what I eat, it's what I breathe. And I love helping other entrepreneurs. Like Throughout my career, even when I had my own startup, I was always helping people. Um, that's something that comes up as you build your network. Um, I was actually the entrepreneur in residence for um, the second accelerator I went through in San Francisco. So, you know, it's part of my six months. I spent three of those months helping other entrepreneurs. And so it just became a thing where, like, I enjoy helping people. I enjoy adding value. And um, this job basically allows me to do that every day. Mm-hmm. Stuff I was doing for free and that I love to do anyway, and now get paid to do. Yeah. Who doesn't want to get paid to do for the things they love? <laughs> so it's, it's been amazing. That's really, I, I, I do coaching and executive work, and that's 
the sole, one of the sole focuses is finding what you love and putting all your energy behind it and finding someone, either customers or an employee that will pay you to do that. Right. Um, so that, that is the magic solution. Um, as a as a founder, you founded a couple of different ventures. Mm-hmm. What have you leveraged from your founder experience in the work that you're doing now? Um, having been a founder, now when I talk to startups, I can cut through the BS real quickly. Yeah, I know that, I know when the founder doesn't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. I know when a founder is talking from a position of a lack of education mm-hmm. or a lack of understanding. Mm-hmm. I know what it feels like to be a founder where you're trying to raise money just to solve a problem you'll know how to solve. You see this with all, all businesses, yeah, all yeah. sizes. Sure. They have a problem, they're not sure how to solve it, so the, so the, so the answer is we'll throw ma- money at it. Yeah, yeah. And the most classic example you see for early stage startups is around marketing. But we're not getting enough users, you know, we just need to give money so we can throw money at it and we'll get users. So that, that's not really how it works. Sure. Because if I give you 100000 a day and you don't know how you're going to use it to get users, yeah. you're just going to throw it all over the place. You're probably going to blow through it. Yeah, or you'll get users, but they'll churn really fast. Yes. The product isn't what it should be. Exactly, right. And so um, I'm able to cut through that. Um, I'm able to leverage my skills of networking. So being a founder, um, being the CEO of a startup, a big part of what you do is networking. Mm-hmm. It's getting out, it's meeting with people, building connections. I'm now able to leverage that for the companies in our portfolio. Mm-hmm. And as well as building the Tech Hope brand and getting out there. I think that's a, a, a huge asset. And I'm able, when I talk to these startups and I give them advice, it's coming from a place of where I've been an operator before. Where I can tell yeah. them, like, hey, I know what you're going through. I know what it feels like. You know, these are things to look out for. These are things that you can do differently. Um, and not from a position of somebody who's just been an observer of companies for a long period of time. Yeah, you've lived it. Yes. You, you've been in the proverbial shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, as Absolutely. they say, um, what what's a challenge that you face as a founder? I know it's been you know a couple years since mm-hmm. you've been in that founder mode, but what's a challenge that you faced as a founder um, that you had to overcome? I would say the first big challenge was so when I started, me and my two co-founders were all developers. We just figured we'd build this cool website and people would use it. That's not how this works. We also realized that. We weren't just building a website, we were building a business, so there was more stuff we had to do and learn. Mm-hmm. And like the first wall I ran into was coming to understanding that I didn't have a network mm. and how important that was. And being really lucky to be in the right rooms and meet the right people to very quickly build out a network here in my local in the local Baltimore tech scene. And it took me a while to realize how big of an issue that was as a founder. Like in order to move forward with your company, you have to build a network because that's where you get the introductions to investors, to future customers, to, you know, to big customers, to advisors, to mentors. Like that all comes happenstance from you getting out, meeting people and adding value to the community. And that I didn't realize how much of a problem that was until I started doing it. Mm. And so that was like that was like the first big hurdle I had to get over. Uh, the next big one was understanding what it meant to raise funding and understanding what investors look for and what their motivations are. Mm-hmm. And they're not out here to give people money just because, or just because they like you, or they, you have a good idea. There's more to it. And to understand that investors, at their core, are capitalists. They're there to make money. And there's only two ways they make money from your company. If, if an investor invests in you, typically, from like a venture model, they only make money if you go public or you get acquired, those are really high bars to meet. And so that means your company has to look like a company that can get there. Well, even to put yourself in a position where you look like you could get there, that's a high bar to meet. And once you start to put all those things in line, it makes it easier to understand, okay, these are the steps I have to get to and this is where I need to be to where I can be considered a a, a venture-backed company, a venturable company. Yeah. But when you don't know that, and also when you don't understand the term early stage, mm. and, you know, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time, like early stage means something different to every funder. Mm-hmm. And like if I'm ever on a panel with a bunch of VCs, my big thing now is to ask them all, what does early stage mean to you? And it's always interesting to see the range of, of, of answers. Yeah. 
And, and, and what I like to say, like, if you think about getting seed investment from an institutional investor or even like a, an angel group, if they're, a comp- if they're a group that looks for traction, your baseline numbers are pretty much going to be around like ten to 15,000 monthly recurring revenue or 100 to 150,000 annual recurring revenue. That's like the that's like the bare minimum baseline for seed investment. Now, it's, there, you know, there are variances in that. It could be all over the place. But if you're just looking for like a pure like blanketed baseline, that's a baseline that you can start off with, right? The idea of making $100,000 in a year is a lot of money for a startup, especially if it's just starting out. And so when you feel, so when you realize what early stage really means has nothing to do with how much time you spent building your company, but has more to do with how far along you got in traction and revenue, it now completely changes the way you think about what you're doing, yeah. and the way you think about getting funding. But until you learn that, yeah. you'll spend time talking to investors and advisors and telling them why you need money and what you need to do and, and you know, and feeling like nobody wants to invest in you, like nobody cares about your idea. Well, it's not that nobody cares about your idea. They're just telling you you're not ready yet. Yeah. And if you don't have that understanding, it could lead to a lot of hurt and bitter feelings. Sure. So I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm learning a lot, which I, which I love about these conversations I'm having. But I want to make sure I get this. The cha- some of the big challenges you faced, um, one was this idea of creating a network um, because you need those relationships, mm-hmm. whether it's for investors or partners or advisors or mentors. And the other piece is this idea of are you a company that looks like a worthwhile investment from a venture capital standpoint, which is do you look like a company that could IPO or could be bought? Yes. That, that's kind of – I just want to make sure I'm capping. Yeah, that, that's it. And, you know, the, the, the earlier a startup gets to understand – what it is that venture investors and even yeah. angel investors are looking for, the easier it is for them to understand why they're getting no's, yeah. or why they're getting yeses, and what they need to do to get there. What were some things that, if you remember, what were some things that you did to overcome some of those challenges in the beginning? So, and I guess the third big, the third challenge was figuring out how to get customers. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was like the big thing, right? And so like, to overcome the networking thing, I just I got lucky, man. So I started going to these events, and there's two events in particular that really spearheaded the beginning of this. One was a, an event in D.C. where you were supposed to uh, go to a panel with three angel investors speaking. Uh, you could pay $75 to go, or you could pay, I think it was like $250 to pitch. So me and all my co-founders went, so the three of us went, we all paid $75 each. To go to this event to listen to these angel investors speak. We get there. They're not really angel investors. They're three venture capitalists who actually do later stage investing. So I didn't realize at the time, but they would have no interest in anybody in this room. Mm. There was this line of entrepreneurs who each did their three-minute pitch, like rapid fire style. And there are two things that stood out to me in this whole the whole conversation, right? Because I was learning about investors and how they and how they thought in this panel but one guy asked the investors well you know could you give me any feedback on my pitch what did you think and the investor said I'm sure you did really fine you know there was a lot of you and this isn't really the the format for that so then it means all these people just wasted 250 hours Mm -hmm. so okay that was pointless I'm glad we didn't do that and then towards the end there was a guy in the back of the room who stood up and said hey what do I have to do to get one of you to write me a check today right so everybody in the, in the room is excited because that's the, the one question and the one reason everybody's there anyway. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason any of us paid money to go here, which I'll tell you now, don't ever pay to pitch. Don't ever pay to go to one of these events. Like, it's just, don't do it. And so the investor said something that was extremely shocking and jarring to me. He said, well, you being in this room and telling me about your startup or bombarding me at the end and giving me your card and trying to email me probably isn't going to get me to take you very seriously. If you want to get to me and get me to think about you as a potential investment, you're going to need somebody I know to vouch for you to me, for me to be interested. And so in that moment, it's like, so this entire thing is a bunch of BS. There's no reason for me to be here. And what I really need to figure out is how to meet somebody that knows you. Well, how are you supposed to do that? 
<laughs> like, okay, there's a whole new question I need to answer, right. and I just wasted a bunch of money. All right, cool. Let's, we got to figure this out. Maybe a couple lessons, though. <laughs> yeah, we got a couple lessons, but that was that was jarring. Um, but then I went to another event where um, it was a viewing party for the CNN special Black in America Silicon Valley, which was the special about the new Ring Accelerator, which I later was a part of. It's kind of dope. Um, so there were founders from the from the new me accelerator there in the room, and I got to meet them and talk to them. Um, they got to meet me and my co-founders. That later led to um, Angela Benton, the the CEO of New Me Accelerator at the time, had a blog. Um, they ended up doing a blog post about our startup, which was really cool, right? Um, but while I was there, I met a lady by the name of Christine Johnson, who now works for an economic development firm in um, Miami, who at the time worked at Tedco. Um, she worked at Teco, and she was also running a, a nonprofit group called Diversitech. And so she met me, and she gave me her card, and you know we connected there. And when she went home that evening, she added me to a, a Facebook group called the Baltimore Tech Group. And so I became really active in that group. And what I didn't realize was in that one group, everybody who's anybody in the Baltimore Tech scene is part of that group. And so within a very short period of time, people had a frame of reference of me from seeing my comments and interaction on Facebook. And then what proceeded after that was over the next couple of weeks was I started going to these events where people were seeing me and they recognized me and they were giving me their card. And I would say in 2012, around the time all this happened, like the, the beginning of 2012, for about the first two months, everybody who gave me their card, I met with for coffee or lunch. I didn't know why I was meeting these people. I didn't really have a reason to meet these people. I just made up in my head this, this, this stupid rule that anybody who gave me their card at any of these events, I was going to reach out to and go to coffee with. And what happened was, in a very short and compact amount of time, I met a lot of people. And what you find in the tech world, startup world, is you create like these pseudo friendships and pseudo relationships where if you see the same person at an event three times, you're buddies now, right? But you know, you have a touch point. And so in a very short period of time, I created this network of people who knew me, who liked me, who liked what I was doing in my product, and who wanted to help me, which was amazing. Yeah. And I did it all by accident. Like I, have, I there was no strategy behind it or anything. It just... It's kind of happened by accident. But looking back, there might there could be a strategy now. Oh, absolutely! I tell right. people all the time, like, hey, this if you need to build a network, this is this the way you go about it. Right? Yeah, I'm the same way. With if I meet someone or exchange a card, I also do coffee. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, for me, there's a I'm trying to create a distinction between having a network just because having a digital network mm -hmm. like LinkedIn connections and Twitter and all that stuff, and having a real network. Right. Like, what is my real network? What is your real network? And those are the people that, who are people that you can actually reach out to. Maybe it's a weak connection, mm -hmm. but you could still say, hey, we had that coffee a while back. I've been thinking about you. I saw you do this. You know, I'd love to chat. Or this person is, you know, in my ear and I think that you guys would really, you guys would really connect. Right. So I, I appreciate that this, uh, the perspective. I want to hear more. I just wanted to jump in. I love it because that's how I am too. I'm like, I will email you. If you give me your card, <laughs> you are getting an email from me and it's Absolutely. about getting coffee. Right. And so, like, uh, it just it allowed me to get over that hurdle of creating this network really quickly. And then that led to me meeting people who were willing to introduce me to investors, right? So, like, oh, this is how the game is played. Yeah. Cool. This, this, this worked. Um, the, the second hurdle that we overcame early was how to get customers. Mm -hmm. And so the big thing was we were spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to get funding so we could pay for marketing. Right, which is the pitfall that you talked about. Yeah, this is a pitfall. <laughs> I mean, we blew $10,000 on a marketing consultant who did absolutely nothing for us. Right? And it's a common thing that happens to startups because you think you're going to get a marketing consultant and they're going to do all this marketing work, but really they just come up with a bunch of strategy. They're high-paid strategists. They're just not what a startup needs. They need actual work done. And so um, I, I one day had lunch or coffee with a guy by the name of Greg Cangelosi. He's the founder of the Baltimore Angels. Um, he ran a startup called Blue Sky. It was an um, email marketing company here in Baltimore that later got acquired. And um, now he's a local investor and you know a power player in the local tech scene. 
It took me, I guess, six or seven months to get to him. Finally got to him. We met for coffee. And What know, are the things that you did? Like you said, you said six or seven months. What was the, so what was the process? I uh, met him at several events and talked to him and told him I wanted to meet with him. Gave him my card like four different times. Emailed him three or four times. Um, but what really happened was I got into Accelerate Baltimore, which was the first accelerator in Baltimore City. And um, he was an advisor to the accelerator. So the very first thing I did after we got in was I emailed like, hey, you know, I'm in Accelerate Baltimore. I'd love to meet you. And that gave us a touch point. He was like, sure, come on. We'll, we'll set it up. So that's, that's, how, that's how I got my in, right? So um, I used the fact that I had this little boost in status to get to him, which as the important person that he is with the, the limited time he has, um, I, I understood so when we sat down, we're talking, I was telling him about my struggles with getting, you know, customers. He's like, you know what I did to get my first couple customers from Blue Sky Factory? He's like, I would spend all day on Twitter and I would just cold tweet people. Here, check this out. And so he showed me how you go on Twitter to search for phrases. And so I then spent like the next four or five months every day for three to four hours looking up birthday. Or, you know, my birthday or what I want for my birthday on Twitter. And I would see people talking about it and I would just say, hey... Uh, looking forward to that birthday party you're having next week. Make sure you create your wish list on giving to you today. Have all your friends buy you that new iPhone you want, right? Something to that effect. And so I would do 30 to 40 or 50 of these every day. And so like one or two people would reject me or, or would block me or say, who the heck are you? Um, another portion of them would ignore me. And then like four or five every day would be like, what's this? Tell me more. And so I just did that every single day. And um, that's how we got to like our first hundred customers. <laughs> was just cold tweeting people grinding grinding um it did get a little awkward though because that around that time two chain song had come out mm -hmm. and so what i kept seeing was all i went for my birthday is a big booty girl that was like a, a thing on twitter every day mm -hmm. so i just had to go through a ton of people talking about that and seeing really weird interactions yeah um you know you would see people be like i didn't know you were in the girls or I think this is what my son wants for his birthday. How much does this cost? I'm like, oh my God, this, there's a lot going on here. It was, it was a very interesting the world. Internet, it's not regulated. It was a very interesting world. Um, but that was the thing that allowed us to get our first initial customers. That allowed us to get to a point where we were starting to get to, get to a point where we were gaining traction that could become a venture company. And from that experience, one thing I tell founders now, I'm very much... A person who comes from the school that thought of uh, 500 startups in the early days would be like, traction, traction, traction. When you pick your first slides, it's about your traction, right? I tell entrepreneurs now that I see a lot of entrepreneurs who spend so much time innovating on their product, they don't take the time to think about innovating on their customer acquisition. Because it doesn't necessarily cost money to get customers. It can cost you time and some of your personal resources, but it doesn't always have to be money. And so if you're an entrepreneur who doesn't have access to capital or doesn't have money to do these things, don't make the excuse that you need money to get marketing. Grind and hustle and figure out a way to get customers without that. Because there are ways to do it. Yeah. You know? And if you look at a lot of the big companies today, they all had hacks when they initially started anyway. Mm -hmm. Like my favorite one is um, PayPal. What people don't realize, PayPal's entire strategy was they would buy things on Amazon and resell them on eBay. But when they resold them on eBay, they would force you to have to use PayPal to buy them. And so at the height of them doing this, 25% of all products on eBay were sold by PayPal. So one in four items that came up on eBay were being sold by PayPal. And they didn't care if they were getting, if they were getting a profit or taking a loss on it. They were just getting more and more people signed up to PayPal. And so it just became a thing where so many people had PayPal, it became the payment processor choice. That's wild. I never, I did not know that story. That's amazing. Like, these are the things that you know entrepreneurs do. I mean, very famously, Airbnb was posting on Craigslist, yeah. which is completely against terms of agreements and probably somewhat illegal. But it didn't matter. They needed to do what they needed to do to get customers. Yeah, and it worked. Yeah. Um, so. I, th I think that's a really interesting point about creative customer acquisition because we talk about. In the startup space or in, you know, with founders, you look at stories and you say, wow, they were really lucky or wow, they really caught a break. But there are all these wacky stories and every startup that really transcends 
has that wacky story mm-hmm. because they did something that was really unconventional or that was totally available, but no one tried it or like just experimented with that. Right. Um, I think that's a really good point. Innovating on customer acquisition. Yes. I like that. Um, it costs time, but you know, we have time. We don't have, a lot of us don't have money. That's, that's the problem. Right. Um, what's, I'm curious, I'm asking pretty much all my guests, what's, what's one of the better pieces of advice you've received as a founder when you were in that founder role? And the best pieces of advice. Don't get hung up on the nose. Yeah. Um, don't get hung up on the nose and understanding that a majority of your day-to-day things you're going to deal with is going to be about how you manage your own personal emotions. As a founder, you're going to get a lot of no's. And you have to be you have to learn to deal with it and learn that it's not about you. It's not personal. And sometimes it's not even about your business. Sometimes it's just about timing. And being okay with that and understanding that that's part of the game and it didn't stop you. But then the managing your personal emotions was key because as the founder, you're always either too high on things or too low on things. There's no middle ground. And so trying to find a way where you can manage that or at least be comfortable in that space is key. Because the times when you get down are the times people don't talk about. They're real. They're real. They hurt. Um, failure sucks. So the whole idea of fail fast, yes, you need to fail fast, learn fast. But every time you fail, sucks. There's, no, there's nothing about failing that feels that feels good. Yeah. Um, every time you get rejected for a program or an accelerator, it sucks. Every time you get a no from an investor, it sucks. And every time you go to a meeting where somebody says, you know, we're really interested, let's have a second meeting, you feel way too excited, more than you should, because nobody's giving you anybody <laughs> or signed a contract that they they're, they're interested, right? And so being able to manage that and go through that. And what I've found is, one, you need to find personal time for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, It took me a long time to learn that no matter how many hours of work I put in, there will always be more work. Like, I can literally work for 23 and a half hours every day, and there will be more work when I wake up in 30 minutes. Like, you just, there's never not any more work in front of you. Yeah. So sometimes you need to take that time out to be around friends and family. And even if you have to schedule that into your schedule and force yourself to do it. And it can feel weird and you can feel anxious about it. Because I used to feel anxious whenever I would watch TV and not have my laptop in front of me. Because that means I wasn't answering emails. Or I wasn't strategizing on something. And like that's a terrible place to be. Where you just can't enjoy like regular things in life because you're not working on your business. Yeah. And then surround yourself with good people who are both at your level, below your level, or ahead of your level, who are also founders, who you can communicate and talk with. Yeah. Because there are things that you're going to go through and things that are going to happen in running a company that nobody else is going to understand, except for other founders. Yeah. Like, your co-founders aren't going to understand, your girlfriend or wife is not going to understand, your friends and family aren't going to understand. But another founder who's been there, who's raised money or who's trying to raise money, or yeah. who's had to make tough decisions, who's had to fire somebody, who's had to fire their friend, They'll be, they'll be able to understand. And having those people around you who you can com- camaraderize with and powwow with and have venting sessions with make all the difference. Because otherwise you just have all that stuff stuck in your head. Yeah. It, you got to get out of your head. Yeah, it's, it becomes a little, little bit of a spiral. Yes. Um, that's good advice. Get, getting, getting comfortable with the nose but also where the conversation went which is, you know, like creating that personal space, having that network, not the professional network necessarily, but that network of non-work yes. to get your mind off of it. Yes. Um, what, what's one thing you know now that you wish you had known in the beginning when you, got, when you were getting everything started? I know we got some nuggets already, but is there something looming out there? I wish I understand, understood customer acquisition better. I wish I understood the difference between doing the B2B and B2C sales cycle. I learned that the hard way. I wish I understood the importance of a network. Mm-hmm. I wish I understood how to raise money. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's more than one thing. I, I, like, like, there's so many things. Where can people go to understand some of those things that you know of right now? There are so many books out there. that That's really the thing it is. I wish I understood the value of books and online resources around running a business. Yeah. There are so many blogs and articles and YouTube videos and amazing books mm-hmm. around how to run a startup or build a startup mm-hmm. that would help alleviate a lot of the headaches you're going to have. Sure. Um, and I just didn't understand the value of that back then. Um, this year, I got myself an Audible account. Nice. And I told myself I was going to listen to 50 books. I'm currently on book 72. In the year? Yes. Amazing. Well, you put the books on time to speed and you listen to them on your commute. Like, it works. Okay. And um, the knowledge in some of these books is so amazing. It's like, I wish I'd have done this sooner. Okay. You know, the one book I did read as a founder was The Lean Startup. Mm-hmm. I love that book. It's an amazing book. If you're a startup founder out there, you haven't read The Lean Startup, go get it today. Go read it. Um, the Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. Yeah. 2.0. Go get it. Go read it. I don't agree with everything in it, but it's a great starting point. Yeah. Uh, Why Combinator Startup School on YouTube. Go watch every single one of those videos. You will learn so much. Yeah. I wish I had take, took, taken the time to take advantage of those resources. Sure. I spent so much time working on my product and thinking through strategy and working on my business. I wasn't actually growing as a founder, mm-hmm. and I wish I had taken more time to think through that and, 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 and done that. Because, like I said, every moment you're not working on your business, you feel like you're doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. But every moment you spend gaining knowledge and, and growing your understanding, yeah, it's only going to make you ten times better. Sound advice. Something I agree with also. Um, who's a founder you admire and why? A founder I admire and why? I don't want to pick a cheese. Brian Brookeen. Brian? Brian Brookeen runs a startup in Miami called Kairos. It's a facial recognition company. Um, He's a good friend of mine. And I admire this man's tenacity. He came out in 2011 and quit his job at Apple along with four um, engineers and started this facial recognition company and was talking about AR and VR way before anybody else was. People thought he was crazy. They told him to stop using these terms. And when I look at how far he's come today, starting a startup in Miami, and I asked him why he go to Miami. He's like, well, when I quit my job in Apple, I just decided, you know, where in the world would I like to live? Where else other than Miami? That was a great answer. Um, but like a few weeks ago, he graduated out of Morgan Stanley's multicultural incubator. Morgan Stanley's incubator. Morgan Stanley has an incubator that this man went through. And you know, he's gone on to raise funding. He has an amazing team. I truly admire that man's tenacity and his intelligence to see it, to see the future that was coming, to see where facial recognition was coming. And yeah, and he's also been a person I could always turn to. When I talked about having people you could talk to, I've always been able to call Brian. Even though, you know, there are times I'll send him an email. He'd be like, hey, talk to my secretary to schedule a time. I'm like, you're friends in real life. Why am I talking to your secretary to schedule a time? But I get it. But I I truly admire Brian and everything he's been able to do with Kairos. Awesome. Well, I I really appreciate that. I'm not familiar with Brian, so I'm definitely going to look him up. Mac, I know we're we're getting a couple signals here that it's time for you to go. I really appreciate you hosting me at TEDCo. And last piece is, where can people follow you? How can they learn from you and, and see what you're up to? You're always more than welcome to find me on LinkedIn, McKeever Conwell. My first name is spelled M-C-K-E-E-V-E-R. If you put that in, you'll probably find me. Or uh, follow me on Twitter, at Matt Conwell, M-A-C-C-O-N-W-E-L-L. Best ways to get in touch with me. I'm pretty accessible. Thanks, Mac. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Founder's Mind. Check back this week to listen to Mac on The Founder's Mind Tangent, where he dives into the importance of creating funding opportunities for, as Arlen Hamilton aptly labeled, underestimated founders. On the next full episode of The Founder's Mind, I have Sean Morrison, 
founder and CEO of Collective Mobile, a mobile development agency. To make sure you don't miss any awesome insights, nuggets of wisdom, and tangents from guests of the Founder's Mind, be sure to subscribe on iTunes and follow along on social media at the Founder's Mind. To learn more about past or future guests and listen to other episodes, you can visit thefoundersmind.com. I look forward to sharing future episodes with you all. And don't forget, reviewing and rating this podcast means a great deal to me and is greatly appreciated. Until next time, take care. In a world going through all of this insanity and try to bring new ideas, make them a reality. Illuminate in the thoughts, make it a priority to implement what you learn, what you get is what you be. In a world full of noise, hard to find that clarity to try to lead subtly, never full of vanity and try to change something small or try to change humanity. Power forward through the dark, founder's mind is what you see. Mind is what you see.